Ciudad, bienvenidos a la Facultad de Ciencias, al auditorio eh, Yaliscali y pues nos da muchísimo gusto que hayan tomado el tiempo para venir a esta, a esta conferencia eh, que hoy nos acompaña el doctor Luciano Musa eh, con el tema Undercovering the Quark eh, Plasma, eh, Scientific and Technological Challenge. Y en, esta, y en esta ocasión tenemos el gusto que además de él que nos acompaña eh, está el doctor eh, Adolfo Andrado Cheto, que es el jefe de la División Académica de Investigación y Posgrado de esta facultad. Eh, nos acompaña eh, también el doctor eh, Guipaí, que es investigador del Departamento de Física de Altas Energías del Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares de esta, de esta universidad. Y también pues, la, la doctora Pilar Carreón Castro, director del Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares. Y pues a nombre del doctor Víctor Manuel Velázquez les damos nada más por la bienvenida. Eh, así que Adolfo, pues te cedo la palabra y muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Bueno, nuevamente les agradecemos por venir y a la directora del Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares por poder organizar estos eventos que son sumamente importantes para la comunidad de la facultad. Eh, tengo el gusto de introducir al doctor Luciano Musa, que será la persona que estará eh, con nosotros trabajando el día de hoy. Él viene del CRN eh, en Ginebra, en Suiza. El doctor tiene pues, una amplia experiencia académica, tiene más de 500 publicaciones internacionales, eh, participa en distintos comités académicos. Eh, así como sociedades científicas, todos ellos relacionados con el área de la física y el tema de la investigación preguntada o ¿no? Entre algunas de las sociedades o comités en los que está, es el Comité de Expertos en FAIR en Germany, es también miembro de eh, JIL, miembro del programa para partículas de JINR en Rusia también y también es del Comité Académico del Instituto de Estudios Avanzados en Frankfurt, en Alemania. Tiene eh, una amplia experiencia de investigación, ha estado en Obelix, eh, en el experimento NA48, en el CEPS NA45, y actualmente trabaja en el programa ALICE, que es lo que nos va a presentar el día de hoy. Entonces, eh, pues agradecemos mucho la visita del doctor. Thank you for the visit. experiment. Uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, I will be um, uh, giving a, an overview, um, not for a technical audience, not for a specialized audience, but really um, uh, a talk that uh, hopefully will be accessible to everyone, um, explaining the um, scientific motivations, but also focusing on the technical and technological uh, uh, aspects and, um, and challenges. So um, let me start with um, this slide, um, which somehow um, gives the um, scientific motivations of the research work we do uh, at CERN, in particular with the ALICE program. So namely, uh, aiming at um, understanding uh, what is the universe made of uh, by looking at matter, at progressively smaller and smaller um, scales. If we, if we start with a block of matter um, which is visible uh, with, uh, with uh, our uh, human eyes, 
And uh, progressivity, we we'll try to look at the smaller scale, and we know that it is composed by, by, by atoms, uh, that atoms um, uh, have uh, their um, uh, internal structure with um, a, a nucleus, uh, which is at the scale of uh, a Fermi, so 10 to the minus 15 uh, meters, and a cloud of electrons um, uh, surrounding the nucleus. And if we go um, at the even a smaller scales, we actually see that uh, um, the um, uh, protons and neutrons, which form the nucleus of atoms, are also composite particles are made of, um, of, of quarks. Um, at the present, uh, based on the, on the current knowledge we have, um, quarks um, are uh, um, considered to be a point-like particles, so elemental particles without any internal structure. Uh, but of course, I mean, this is based on the current knowledge. Um, um, and uh, it's not excluded that maybe when we will be able to look at, uh, at matter at even a smaller scales, so this may reveal um, uh, a further internal structure. Now, what is really particular, um, so the, 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 the quarks are um, um, interrupt via a force, which is called the strong force. Mm -hmm. Um, this is part of, um, um, is described by the, a theory which is called the quantum chromodynamics, as for instance the electromagnetic uh, interaction, uh, for instance, between the electrons and the nucleus is described by the quantum electrodynamics, the strong force which uh, binds quarks together to form protons and neutrons is uh, described by a theory which is called the quantum chromodynamics. And one of the, the distinctive features of the theory is that the interaction between quarks uh, becomes weaker um, uh, when uh, the quarks exchange uh, a large uh, momentum uh, or uh, equivalently following the Heisenberg principle at short distances. This is called asymptotic freedom. On the contrary, uh, when uh, they, uh, there are processes where, where they exchange a small amount of uh, uh, energy, uh, or alternatively, when they are very far apart, the force increases. So that's uh, different with respect to the electromagnetic force, which decreases when the particles are, uh, are uh, when the distance between particles increases. Such that uh, essentially, quarks and gluons uh, they are uh, permanently bound uh, together um, uh, to form uh, protons and neutrons, or more exotic particles, which we call hadrons, from the Greek hadrons, which means strong. And uh, um, now, so what happens is really uh, described here in a very pictorial way. So imagine uh, um, uh, to have a quark-antiquark -quark pair and to try to pull them apart. It's like if there is an energy string between them, and when you pull them apart, um, the um, uh, energy um, increases, and a certain point is sufficient to create a new pair of quark-antiquark. Um, which is then energetically convenient instead of increasing the energy in the stream. And that's what happens, is such that uh, essentially um, uh, one never obtains a free, a free work. So that is called uh, uh, confinement. On the other hand, um, if we increase the uh, temperature or if we increase the, the, the pressure of a system composed of, of, of quarks, at a certain point, we are able to form an extended system of quarks and gluons where the individual quarks and gluons they are not anymore confined in, in a single hadron, but they are free to roam on a larger volume. And that is called the quark-gluon plasma, which is the main goal of our um, research area. Now, allow me just one very um, um, uh, more physics-oriented slide. What you see here on the plot on, uh, on, on the left is the um, uh, strong coupling uh, um, uh, um, uh, of the strong interaction. So imagine for the electromagnetic intera interaction, essentially the first approximation is a constant, is the, 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 the fine structure constant. Here you see it really depends on the momentum scale. And when you go to very low momentum or to large distances, it increases. While on the contrary, when you go to very short distances, then there is the asymptotic freedom. And uh, now this can be um, uh, studied, uh, the, the, 
the equations um, that describe the strong interaction cannot be resolved analytically, um, but um, you know um, they can be resolved um, by discretizing uh, the space-time uh, in a lattice and putting the quarks in the nodes of this lattice and the gluons are the links in between the, um, the nodes of, 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 of the lattice. And by doing uh, these uh, simulations and these uh, um, uh, numerical calculations, um, uh, we predict uh, that uh, there is a phase transition. You see in the diagram uh, on the right side, you see on the y-axis the temperature of the system, uh, and on the x, um, um, you see the uh, baryon uh, um, uh, potential. Uh, if you want, uh, this is, uh, represents the number of uh, um, um, uh, baryons, so protons and neutrons that you have in your system. Yeah. And you see that there is a phase transition. At low temperature or smaller density, essentially quarks and gluons are always confined inside hadrons. But if we increase the temperature or if we increase the pressure at a certain point, there is a phase transition when then the quarks and gluons become free, uh, forming in the plasma. And that is uh, the state of matter that we would like to uh, study, that we are, uh, that we are studying. Not that uh, um, uh, at uh, um, vanishing uh, um, ion density, which means that we have the same amount of uh, uh, protons and antiprotons, um, which are the conditions that we study at the, um, at the LHC. When we increase, uh, the, the confinement is obtained at the temperature which is of the order of 10 to the 12 uh, Kelvin. So it's a temperature which is much larger, you will see this in a moment, than the temperature, uh, four order of magnitudes larger than the temperature at the core of the sun. Okay, so uh, now this is a system which then, uh, if it is a plasma, can be studied uh, um, um, as a thermodynamical system. We can, uh, for instance, uh, um, 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 described using a lattice QCD as a function of the temperature, um, uh, typical thermodynamic quantities as the uh, energy uh, density, the entropy, or uh, the pressure of the system. And you see that at this uh, temperature of 10 to the 12 uh, Kelvin, uh, this is expressed in MeV, so it's around 155 MeV, there is uh, this uh, phase transition where there is a sudden and uh, rapid increase of all thermodynamic uh, quantities, which corresponds to the fact that the system has a transition where the degrees of freedom of the system increase. They are not, not anymore the protons and the neutrons, but they are the uh, quarks and the gluons. And the other interesting thing to, to, to note is that when, even when we go to very high temperature, for instance around the 300 MeV, these are the conditions uh, that, uh, under which we are studying uh, the system uh, in our experiment, we are still 20% um, um, below from the non-interrupting limit, the Boltzmann limit, where quarks and gluons would be really free particles as an ideal, um, as an ideal gas. Now, this is also very interesting because uh, uh, it essentially, uh, this is the state of matter which is believed to have existed in the first uh, um, uh, uh, microseconds of the history of the universe. Immediately after the Big Bang, let's say about 10 picoseconds after its creation, uh, matter was really in a state of uh, uh, a quark gluon plasma where quarks and gluons and, and are um, uh, were, were free. And then uh, um, uh, um, uh, progressively the temperature of the universe started to decrease, and then quarks and gluons started combining, forming the protons and neutrons, and then uh, uh, progressively um, atoms and more complex structures have been formed uh, till uh, the universe as we observe it and as we know it uh, today. Now, um, these studies are carried out at CERN, which is the European Center for Nuclear Research. It was founded uh, in 1954, originally with 12 member states. Uh, today we have 23 member states. Um, um, uh, funding uh, uh, the, the, um, the laboratory. And it was really founded, uh, you know, this is in 1954, shortly after the Second World War. Um, um, Europe was devastated by the Second World War. It, it, it was uh, um, uh, essentially many of the scientists escaped, uh, many came to the US. The idea was really to have a laboratory 
uh, to have um, uh, all European scientists, but also scientists from all over the world, uh, coming to work together with the um, uh, based on the value of science for uh, for peace. At present, we have 2,400 staff uh, in the community, much larger, um, uh, which is of about 13,000 scientific um, uh, users coming from uh, from all over the world. So that is the uh, world's biggest laboratory for particle physics. It's located uh, near uh, Geneva. Um, so this in this ideal view, you see this is the uh, lake of Geneva. That's the city of Geneva here. That's the airport. Um, and this ring that you see is the largest um, accelerator uh, existing in the world. It has a circumference of 27 kilometers. And uh, it is actually um, uh, uh, located across the border between uh, Switzerland, you see this dashed um, uh, white line, and, uh, and, and France. Actually, most of the accelerator is in the, in the French territory, but the main uh, site of the laboratory is in the Swiss uh, territory. Now, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, as I already mentioned, it has a 27 kilometer in circumference. It is located 100 meters underground. Um, and uh, uh, it is mostly composed by, well, it is composed by superconductive, uh, uh, superconductive magnets, uh, which steer the focus of the beam, uh, such that the beam has a very small uh, spot, um, but also they steer the beam um, around this very large uh, circumference, um, and they accelerate the, the particles until uh, they reach a velocity which is closer to the speed of light. And then the uh, beam path across in four uh, points around which we um, uh, build the detectors. Uh, so we have four main detectors, um, which are called um, um, Atlas, Alice, LHCB, and uh, uh, CMS. So um, in these four points, the uh, path of the beams, they cross, so the, the, the particles, they collide, they interact. Uh, releasing uh, in a minuscule volume a very large amount of energy which creates, um, uh, um, um, uh, depending on the type of collision, but let's say tens of particles who are colliding protons uh, or tens of thousands of particles who are colliding uh, uh, nuclei of uh, heavy atoms. Uh, um, so far we've been colliding mostly um, uh, lead, uh, lead atoms. Now if hopefully this will work, there is a short animation just to give you an idea of um, how um, this, this, this work. So we have um, um, the beams are uh, structured in bunches of particles. Each bunch has um, um, a length of about 30 centimeters and there are about uh, um, uh, 10 to the 11 protons in each bunch. And the bunches are spaced um, um, uh, time-wise uh, by 25 nanoseconds. So this corresponds to about 7, 8 meters. And you see they, 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 they collide every 25 nanoseconds, this bunch of particles, at the axial center of the uh, very complex uh, um, uh, detectors. And the time uh, um, the, the particles which are produced in the interaction, uh, the time it takes to fly out through the detector is also the order of tens of nanoseconds. Note that in each bunch there are many uh, protons, and um, it happens that it actually when two bunches cross, um, many, part, many interactions uh, occur at the same time. We can have, uh, um, let's say, tens of interactions every 25 nanoseconds. Right, so uh, the principle is that the energy release in the collision uh, um, uh, create new particles, and, um, mm -hmm. and um, we, study, we, have, we study the properties of, of the new particles created, and we study um, the uh, properties of the interaction. One of the four experiments, as you've seen, is the ALICE, um, which stays for a large ion collider um, experiment, uh, which is the experiment uh, of which presently I have the um, privilege of being the spokesperson, and where there is a strong participation from, uh, uh, from Mexican uh, scientific institutions. Uh, it is a large international collaboration. Uh, we have uh, at present 174 institutes coming from uh, uh, 40 countries um, uh, for a total of about 2,000 members 
um, out of which um, of which about a um, thousand are physicists, so they they, they participate in the um, in the preparation of the scientific publications. Now the experiment uh, you see here the main stages was proposed in the early 90s. Um, the final approval came in 97, and the bulk of the construction was in the period from 2000 to 2007, and the installation was completed uh, in 2008. And we are taking uh, data and producing physics results uh, uh, since 2009. We had uh, a first campaign of about 10 years, which was completed uh, in 2018, and uh, that in the past three years we've been upgrading the detector to prepare it and, and enhance its. Uh, um, um, its capabilities for the um, launch in a new physics campaign in the current decade. Mexico is a very important partner of the ALIS collaboration uh, since the very beginning. At present, it has 48 collaborators, including 13 scientists and now in a PhD from, uh, let's say, four different institutions. Uh, we have five different uh, teams, including the two teams from uh, um, UNAM, the team of the Institute of Physics and the team of the Institute of Nuclear Science. Now, um, I have here another, uh, sorry, yeah, I have here another short um, animation just to display a bit better the, the, the Alice detector. So the, the quality of the image is not uh, very neat, but anyway, just to get an impression. So um, the plane of the accelerator is slightly tilted, so not all experiments are at the same uh, uh, depth underground. Alice is about 60 meters underground. It is contained on the central part inside a very large uh, magnet, this red structure. is the largest worm magnet uh, ever built. Um, it has 60 meters of height, 60 meters wide, and um, uh, it is uh, 60 meters also um, uh, long. Um, it, it is composed by a complex set of, um, of, um, of detectors. Uh, now, in this view, you see at the heart of uh, the uh, detector um, um, uh, a silicon uh, um, uh, detector, which I will discuss a bit more in detail. Um, uh, this is followed by a time projection chamber, um, which is a gaseous detector, a transition radiation detector, which is also a gaseous detector. And these are part of what we call trackers. So they have the function of reconstructing the uh, trajectory of uh, uh, electrically charged uh, particles. So these particles, uh, they leave a trail of ionization either on the silicon or on the gas. And, and, and by measuring this trail, we can reconstruct with very high precision uh, their trajectories. Um, the detectors are inside a magnet. So their they are, uh, trajectories are bent. And by measuring the curvature of that trajectory, we can therefore infer the momentum of the energy of all of the particles. By measuring the momentum of the particles and also the uh, energy that they release in the detectors, we can also identify uh, the type of particle. And actually, there are different techniques to identify the particles. I have no time to, uh, to, to explain this. Now, um, Mexico contributed to the uh, Alice detector in a very prominent way with the construction of the Accord system, which is an array of detectors on the outside, um, which is used to um, detect, uh, to detect um, um, uh, cosmic uh, rays coming from, from, from outside and generate a trigger signal. Um, then we have the AD and the zero um, detector. The zero detector is also a trigger detector. It's a very important detector uh, for the, uh, because it provides the level zero trigger, but it also provides important information on the basic features of the uh, interaction. And for the upgrades that we just have completed, uh, there was again a very important contribution with the realization of uh, two new detectors. Uh, called um, uh, FB0, FDD, and also a contribution to the time projection chamber upgrade. Um, a very important a contribution is also the one to the computing. Of course, um, processing the data requires a large amount of computing, and UNAM contributes with uh, a tier two computing uh, uh, center. Okay, so um, now, uh, 
what would we do? So we collide essentially different um, um, species. We collide protons. Um, this is happens most of the time during the year, actually eight months a year uh, at the LHC, um, we collide protons. But um, a month a year, we also collide nuclei of, uh, of heavy atoms, mostly so far lead atoms, but we also had a short run of xenon. And we also uh, produce collisions of uh, single protons with uh, uh, lead, lead nuclei. So in the Alice experiment, we are mostly interested in lead-lead collisions, uh, which were we formed, um, the quarky gluon plasma. Originally, uh, the proton collisions were meant to provide a, a reference sample uh, to really um, uh, be able uh, to uh, separate uh, uh, the features of uh, uh, the lead collisions, which are, can be really referred to the formation of quarky gluon plasma and also the proton nucleus collision. One of the main outcomes of the first 10 years of, uh, of studies with the, at the LHC is that uh, we had hints of uh, the properties of corticulum plasma, also in PP collisions and proton light collisions, which is one of the intriguing uh, uh, discoveries done at the LHC, and uh, the onset for the formation of the corticulum plasma will be addressed uh, um, uh, in, in the following years. And this is really an area where UNAM uh, plays uh, quite an important uh, uh, role. Okay, so I've been talking about the QGP and the obvious question is, um, do we form really QGP in these collisions? Well, as I've shown to you, according to Lattice QCD, um, uh, QGP is formed uh, when uh, the um, uh, energy uh, density of the system exceeds a value of about 0.5 GV per cubic Fermi or a critical or pseudo-critical temperature of about 156 um, um, uh, MeV. And uh, um, so, um, and we have tried to measure these quantities. Um, let me come here. Um, now, of course, all this would require um, uh, a talk by itself, but just to give you an idea, uh, that we, we do measure the energy density, we measure the, the temperature of the system, we also measure the volume uh, and, uh, and the lifetime of this fireball which is formed in, uh, in the collisions. Uh, now, these measurements will be refined um, in the course of the following years, but certainly we have quite strong indications that um, we, we do form a quarter group of plasma with uh, an energy density which is uh, largely exceeds the critical energy density you see here of 12 GV per cubic Fermi and the temperature which also largely exceeds the critical temperature for the formation of, of, of the QGP and we have uh, this fireball with, uh, with a rather long lifetime. Um, okay, so uh, now I don't have the time to you know, present uh, not even uh, an overview of uh, the wealth of results achieved in the first 10 years. I just wanted to give you a, a very intuitive uh, uh, description of uh, the picture that has emerged in, 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 in these decades of studying of the corticum plasma. So essentially, this represents the collision of two lead nuclei. They are represented as disks because due to their um, speed, they are uh, Lorentz contracted, so they, there is a Lorentz contraction, so they have uh, uh, this uh, disk um, uh, very thin, which they collide, not necessarily they completely overlap, uh, they may be offset, and the distance between the center is what we call the impact parameter, and in the collision uh, there is a very large amount of energy which is released in this very minuscule volume, um, uh, where then uh, um, there is uh, the formation of the quark gluon plasma. So imagine that this plasma as uh, our current understanding is that quarks and gluons are deconfined, but they are still strongly coupled, so they interact um, uh, with um, um, a very short uh, mean free path. So there is uh, uh, a lot of interaction, uh, and so they, 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 they tend to thermalize. So imagine uh, like a liquid where quarks and gluons and eventually they, they thermalize achieving a, a, a mean uh, um, um, uh, velocity. So there is a, a, an expansion, they all move at the same velocity, radial expansion, but depending on the initial conditions, 
um, the, 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 the plasma may actually have a, an asymmetry, and from the asymmetry of the system, we actually infer a lot of properties. Then it quickly cools down, and when it cools down and the temperature drops again below 155 uh, uh, MeVs, then the quarks and gluons quickly recombine, forming uh, again many particles, protons, neutrons, but uh, many other particles, pions, and etc. Uh, which then uh, they continue for some time. They continue to uh, interact. Uh, so at this point, uh, uh, there is um, a chemical uh, equilibrium. So the, the, the different uh, the bonds of different particle species is fixed, uh, but they continue to interact, and, and, and so they are kinematic properties that they continue to, to change. Till a certain point, the system is so diluted that they also stop interacting, and so there is a so-called kinetic phase out, and then they fly out and they reach our detectors, okay? And you see here the time scale of the different stages. So essentially we have the formation of the quark gluon plasma within a Fermi over C. Uh, the um, kinetic freeze out happens at about 10 Fermi over C, and the reach of our detectors at about 10 to the 15 Fermi over C, okay? So what we really see is, is the um, result of, um, of, of, of these many particles flying out in all possible directions. So we have been publishing so far 400 papers uh, with all the results of the detail characterization of what we have been uh, discovering and uh, the features of, of, of the QGP. We have an important, a number of very important um, 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 uh, discoveries. Well, we had uh, the first measurement of the mass dependence of uh, medium energy loss. So you have uh, um, uh, quarks, also very energetic quarks, that traverse in uh, this plasma lose their uh, energy. And uh, we measured um, uh, the, their energy loss and how this energy loss depends on the mass of the quark. We discovered a new regime uh, for uh, the production of uh, states of uh, charm and anti-charm, uh, so this is a, a, of pairs of, of, of quarks. And uh, as I mentioned, we also have discovered the, um, uh, that, that in proton collisions and proton nucleus collisions, we, have, uh, uh, we may have uh, effects that uh, are very similar to the features of the corpogluon plasma. But we also um, um, do research in, uh, in other domains. For instance, we are systematically studying uh, the strong interaction or the residual strong interaction between uh, uh, hadrons, uh, essentially any pair of, um, of, 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 of hadrons. Uh, so this is an example uh, um, of uh, publication of Nature of, um, of two years ago. Uh, we also do studies which are very relevant for the search of dark matter in uh, a space form um, uh, experiments like uh, uh, AMS and many other uh, uh, topics. Okay, so um, I have to um, be a little bit quicker now. I would like to um, talk a little bit about the technical uh, and technological challenges, and I will do that by taking one, uh, one, one example. That is the example of the silicon tracking detectors, um, which uh, um, um, are playing uh, more and more an important role, I would say a dominant role in, in, in our field, and I will also try to apply the connections with uh, uh, other fields, either in science or uh, uh, in industry. Let me uh, start with this picture, um, which a little bit um, uh, explains why do we need um, silicon detectors. So this is uh, an event display of a single lead collision. So that is what uh, our um, um, colleagues, physicists, uh, sitting in the control room of Alice, they see in the event display uh, when the experiment is, is running. So essentially it's a picture, you see these colored uh, uh, lines that represent uh, the trajectories of individual particles. You see there are uh, literally um, tens of thousands of particles. And uh, um, uh, if we take their projection, uh, for instance, in the, uh, uh, in the transverse plane, uh, this is a projection in, in the uh, longitudinal plane, essentially we have to go and resolve uh, these uh, trajectories, and in particular the origin of the particles very close to the interaction point. So you see that immediately to resolve such a picture, we need the detectors with a very, very high spatial resolution but also fast, fast detectors, because these collisions occur at a very high speed. Um, you know, 25 nanoseconds we have, um, particular now for, uh, in, in, 
the new uh, in the, in the, in the new runway that we just started, there will be on average five collisions. So five of these pictures um, uh, will appear every 25 nanoseconds. Okay. So if you take uh, a, a digital camera, the most sophisticated digital camera of our of our phones, so this they have a time response of milliseconds. They are very far from providing uh, the features that would be needed for for, for this detector. Um, yeah, this is um, um, uh, um, uh, an event where you see the five collisions uh, uh, in, in, a, in a window of 25 nanoseconds. Now, another very important point is that um, when you have the interaction of, of uh, two protons or two nuclei, some of the particles have a very short lifetime. When I say short lifetime, uh, um, I'm referring uh, about the scales is of 10 to the minus 23 seconds, but let's say they have a mean proper decay lengths of uh, the order of uh, tens of microns, okay? So they travel for tens of microns and then they decay, and, uh, and, and they decay too fast. Uh, so we cannot put a detector at tens of microns from the interaction point. Um, we, the closer we can go is uh, literally um, of the order of uh, a few centimeters, okay? So that's the closest we can go. Um, and therefore, we don't see the, 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 the original particles, but we only see their daughter particles. For instance, here it's a lambda C, which has a, 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 a decay length of 60 microns. It decays, it can decay in three particles, a pion, a proton, and a kern. And what our detector see are the pion, proton, and kern. And by reconstructing the trajectory of these particles, we have to be able to see whether they were originated from the primary interaction point or from a displaced vertex. We also have to, um, to reconstruct the, uh, the momentum of the mother particle, such that we can reconstruct all the properties of the uh, mother particle. So this is uh, the job of the silicon trackers, um, which we developed precisely for the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, this uh, demanded a, a tremendous R&D from uh, the international community. It took about um, 20 years to develop the right detectors, but eventually we made it, um, and um, silicon detectors, they are pixel detectors, silicon strip detectors, they are at the heart of all LHC experiments, but I would say at the heart of all modern uh, experiments. Yet, um, well, maybe I can skip this, and leave it uh, as a reference, it's just to recall briefly that uh, um, silicon detectors are simply based on uh, um, PN junctions um, um, uh, reverse the bias, and so what happens is that you have uh, um, a part of the silicon uh, depleted, so it's uh, like a silicon uh, uh, chamber which is completely depleted, there are no free carriers, and when, you are, uh, when the silicon is crossed by a particle, it produces a trail of electrons and holes, then we apply um, a voltage and then we collect the electrons and holes on the two opposite uh, uh, electrons. So that's uh, the general principle. I, I leave it to you um, to, to look at it, but um, I, I assume that many of you are uh, quite familiar with this type of detectors. And then we segment the electrons and we can have uh, either uh, uh, microstrip detectors or we can have a segmentation in pixels. And these are the pixel uh, detectors, which are not uh, too different from uh, the pixel sensors that we have in the ordinary digital uh, cameras. Yet the pixel detectors we developed for, for the LHC um, are so-called hybrid pixel detectors. Namely, you have the detector is a piece of silicon, and then the result electronics is a separate chip. The advent of um, the VLSI um, in, in the field of integrated circuits was very important to achieve this goal. And then they are micro -bond bonded together. This is expensive. Um, 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 it, there are uh, very few manufacturers in the world, literally a handful of manufacturers. Uh, it sets uh, limitations on the power consumption because uh, this interconnection has a large capacitance. Large capacitance means large noise, and then one has to compensate this by putting more current, so more, more, more power. So the dream since we started uh, uh, developing pixel detector was one day to have the sensor and the electronics all in one shape. And, uh, uh, and that's what we managed to do. Um, in particular, this was an achievement of, uh, of, of the Alice experiment. Uh, it took to us another 15 years, but in 2015, we managed to develop a sensor which integrates
integrates uh, electronics uh, and, and the pixel sensor all in one single piece of, um, of, of silicon. Um, I will not explain this, but this is, you see, it's a 3D representation. Um, you have a, a, an epitaxe, a, a layer of high resistivity silicon of about 25 microns, which is grown epitaxially on a standard substrate of a CMOS wafer used to manufacture the standard integrated circuits as microchips. And then on top, we build our, um, um, you see these black dots are the um, pixels themselves, the electrodes which collect the ionization charge, and all this dense um, structure is the read out uh, uh, circuit. This is a really unprecedented. It's the first time um, we could achieve um, uh, the integration of everything in a chip. Um, and uh, I would like to only to outline one point is that the capacitance of the electrodes is as low as 5 femtofarad. Maybe to most of you, it doesn't tell a lot. But uh, let me explain uh, this uh, for, uh, for a moment. 5 femtofarad means that if you put a signal uh, of 1,000 electrodes, you're already producing at the output of the electrode a signal which is of the order of a few hundred millivolts. So maybe it's so low that essentially we are close to have um, a sensor that will not need any amplifier. Okay, so that would be the dream uh, detector with applications really in many, in many fields. Um, now, this is uh, just to explain that essentially you have a matrix of um, 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 pixels in each uh, sensor. There are a million of pixels organized in uh, rows and columns, and each um, pixel has its own amplifier, a comparator, and a digital circuit to extract uh, the uh, information. And this is uh, the building block of uh, um, uh, a new uh, inner tracking system that closes to the interaction point. Uh, that we installed uh, in uh, last year in uh, in June uh, in uh, in the Alice experiment. The full detector uh, is the largest uh, um, uh, camera ever built with 12.5 billions of, uh, of of pixels, each providing uh, um, a special resolution in the three directions of five uh, uh, micrometers, with um, a readout rate, a maximum particle readout rate of 100 megahertz per square uh, centimeter. Now, um, um, it would have been uh, very nice, but I would not do this for 10 reasons, uh, to explain the connections with uh, the development of CMOS sensors. You know that for, um, uh, in the late uh, 70s, 80s, the CCD detectors appeared, and this will um, give a um, st uh, start of the birth to what is called the digital imaging revolution, okay? And, and then, you know, the digital devices became part of our daily daily life. Maybe not many of you know that uh, in the early 90s, um, um, the CMOS sensors were um, essentially only used by in our field. And then uh, there was um, a small team at NASA trying to develop um, also a CMOS sensor. And, uh, um, and at that time, people regarded this as like uh, a bit of a game for toy cameras and etc. Now, to make it just to cut it short, it, it's a very interesting story uh, that I, I like to tell in, in other seminars. Uh, but in 10 years, the CMOS sensors have completely taken over the full market of, uh, of digital cameras. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are about uh, uh, 10 billion of CMOS cameras built every year. Um, it's, it's a market of the order of uh, 20 billion of dollars a year and represents 95% of the digital cameras built on nowadays. The CCDs are only used for very special um, uh, applications, okay? Um, so, uh, we like to, to, to say that we also have contributed uh, a bit to that development since we were collaborating together with the first team that developed uh, these cameras. Although, although um, we work on cameras for particles and not for visible light. Here there is, a, a, again, a short um, um, video to, to show how we do this. So this is a CMOS wafer, um, uh, and then uh, um, we, we um, thin it and dice it to single out individual sensors. Uh, the, 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 the thickness is 50 microns. Then we have uh, to place uh, 
uh, interconnect uh, bonds to um, uh, interconnect the sensors to an electrical substrate to bring power and, uh, and extract signals. A number of these sensors have to be put together and mounted uh, on an electrical substrate, which is a flexible uh, printed circuit made of uh, a captain using aluminum as, uh, as, as uh, an electrical conductor. And all this is supported by carbon fiber, very lightweight carbon fiber structure. A structure as this is extremely um, rigid, but has a weight of uh, a, few, a few grams. Then the individual uh, um, units, which we call also staves, um, are put together to form the different uh, um, uh, layers and to build uh, uh, the uh, detector cylinder, which is then uh, placed at the um, uh, interaction point or around the interaction point. You see this is the beam pipe and the vacuum where the beams uh, um, are accelerated and circulate and collide at the axial center. And then, of course, we need a support structure, again, made of carbon fiber uh, to carry all services and extract all the signals uh, and transport the information in an optical fashion to our computing uh, center. Okay, so that's the inner tracking system, uh, the, as I said, the, a few pictures here, the largest camera uh, ever built. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I still have a few more minutes. Maybe I can use them to say that um, um, the first 10 years are what we call ALICE-1, the phase one of the ALICE experiment, which was completed in 2018. I've mentioned several times that the last three years, the, uh, the detector was fully revamped, but we have just started um, um, a few months ago, uh, what we call a run three. So a new phase, the phase two of the ALICE experiment, which will continue uh, till 2032. And then we have a very ambitious plan uh, for a completely new detector. That's a really a major enterprise. Um, and we started working on that now because uh, this uh, complex detector takes uh, typically 10 years uh, to be uh, developed and built. And the idea is to install in 2033-34 uh, uh, a completely new detector uh, to continue our researches in the next uh, decade till uh, essentially the uh, 20, uh, 2040. And, and at each of these upgrades, of course, we improve significantly the performance of, uh, of, uh, of our detector. Now, um, the, um, in, uh, in LS2, we have uh, um, had um, the essentially major upgrade of many components, and I just wanted to mention uh, a few where um, uh, Mexico has contributed. This is the time projection chamber. Um, it's a large um, uh, gaseous detector, 5 meters of diameter, 5 meters of length. And UNAM has participated and contributed to the development of uh, the chamber high voltage monitoring system. A major contribution was the, um, is the uh, development of uh, a very important component of the fast interaction trigger, the FV0, uh, which uh, development which was led by, completely by the Mexican um, um, Teams, and you see here uh, nice pictures of uh, the uh, during the assembly and then uh, after the installation uh, um, uh, at, uh, at the experiment uh, uh, where you can recognize here some of your colleagues sitting uh, in, uh, in, in the room. Now, um, the um, point that uh, um, uh, to which I would like to dedicate really a few seconds is the data processing. Um, we, the experiment produces a large amount of data of the order um, uh, of uh, um, uh, 3.5 terabytes per second, so this is a huge um, data throughput. Uh, data is transported via optical links over a distance of a few hundred meters in uh, what we call the first level processor, where we apply a first level um, uh, reconstruction and compression of uh, of, of the data. At this point, we achieve a compression factor by, uh, of five. And then uh, data continues to be transported on a new computing center, we call it O-square, where actually we do a full reconstruction of the event, uh, quasi online, essentially, uh, such that we have uh, a selection of the events to be stored, of the information to be stored based on a full reconstruction of the event. And after we do that, we're able to 
um, uh, reduce the um, uh, data throughput uh, uh, significantly to essentially down to 40 gigabytes per second. So this is really a, a large compression uh, uh, factor. I mention this because the development of the square uh, based on heterogeneous um, uh, hardware platform also represents a very nice opportunity for engineering departments interested in developing uh, um, uh, new computing uh, uh, techniques. Um, yes, and the last slide um, uh, is to again emphasize that we just started, uh, we, we, we got the approval of a letter of intent for the installation of this new detector, Alice 3. Um, uh, in, the, in the next decade. Um, it's a very challenging um, detector based on novel detector based on innovative technologies relevant for many fields and uh, uh, application. And we really hope that uh, uh, the Mexican institutions and UNAM in particular will be very interested in uh, playing a, a major role in, uh, in this enterprise. Um, I made the idea uh, to show an example of application outside um, HEP, but I see that uh, I've essentially run out of, of time, so I can stop it there, and then if you would have questions, uh, I, I, can, I can just show quickly. But, you know, but it, take this really as an example. Um, I could uh, have many others, and it's an example dear to my heart for many reasons. First of all, because I'm directly involved um, uh, in, in this development, but also because um, uh, the application, uh, um, I had a family member that, uh, that has been suffering in the past years of, of cancer, and I had an extra motivation to work, uh, to work on, on, on that. I'm talking here about hadron therapy. Um, the physics uh, rationale is that um, with, um, um, if you have a deep-seated um, tumor, and uh, you, um, uh, you know, the classical or conventional way of uh, irradiating uh, uh, the tumor is by using uh, X-rays. And um, uh, you know that um, if you look at the, um, the energy uh, deposited, uh, uh, for instance, in 20 centimeters of water, this is very similar to what you would have on the typical uh, tissues of, of, of the brain. You see that it's not flat, but essentially it's nearly flat, right? I mean, it, it really um, drops only by factor by 30% at, at most. Which means that when we want to radiate the tumor, we are actually depositing a lot of energy in, in the other tissues, in the SC ones. And you know that the way of trying to uh, limit the uh, side effects is essentially by having many beams, right, uh, with many different angles, or close in the, in the volume of the tumor. Still, the collateral effects are quite important. Right? This is the main limitation of the X-ray um, irradiation. So, um, in the past, um, um, let's say, two decades, um, um, even a little bit more, was the development of the so-called Hadron therapy, which uses uh, protons or um, um, uh, ions, um, um, as a source of radiation, which have the advantage that the energy is deposited uh, is, is in a very narrow, um, you see there is a very narrow peak, so this is the Braga, the Braga peak. And we can control uh, the distance where the energy is deposited by varying the energy of, of, of the proton beams or of the carbon, uh, the carbon beam. This should uh, have a small animation. By varying the energy, we can really, if we know the position of the tumor, we can really uh, deposit the energy, um, uh, uh, most of the energy there. Uh, so this uh, is a research that we have carried out in collaboration with um, um, a radiological team, uh, with an oncological team, and, and, and etc. Now you see here the difference. On the left, uh, you see the typical radiation field um, um, of, um, of, um, with an X-ray treatment, where you see that the plant dose still has a significant amount of radiation outside the tumor volume, uh, while with the proton treatment, and one achieves even better results with um, uh, carbon uh, ions, we manage really to contain the radiation within really the volume uh, of, uh, of the tumor. So, um, and uh, yeah, let me also show this to you. It's, it's really a pity that unfortunately it's, this technology still is not well spread worldwide, okay? 
Uh, so only 1% of the patients that would be good candidates to be uh, treated uh, with hadronotherapy and would largely benefit from, 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 from it cannot be treated simply because there are not enough um, uh, treatment rooms um, around the globe. And also the geographical distribution uh, is, 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 is um, uh, not um, uh, uniform. Okay, so um, now, what, what is the limitation of the hadron therapy? The limitation uh, is uh, to know the position of the tumor and the consistency and the composition and of uh, the, the density of the tissues um, uh, um, uh, that are before the tumor. So we need to have a tomography um, that can give us the precise position of the tumor, but also the density of the tissues around the tumor. And this is done with X-rays. Um, so there is an X-ray 3D CT, um, and this does not provide um, a good resolution. Um, there is a very, very big systematic error, up to 5%. And, um, um, And the, um, the, um, so there is a possibility of doing it with the protons themselves or the carbon ions. Is to use protons, um, but this needs to be done at the slightly in a higher energy, which is what we can do nowadays. We crank up the energy at a few hundred MeV, and then uh, we do uh, a tomography, uh, and then we reduce the energy to 60 MeV, which is what is needed to reach the typical position of, uh, of, of, of a tumor. Now, the limitation, however, is that uh, with the current detectors, it takes about uh, 10 minutes uh, to um, have a reasonable uh, tomography. We have to collect about 10 to the 9 proton tracks. And during this time, uh, the patient moves. Um, you know, of course, the patient is put in a, in, in a, a still position, in a steady position, and just try to be kept um, uh, very steady. But still, the, the tumor moves. So that is uh, the main, uh, the main limitation. So there is a strong motivation. This would improve significantly if we could have detectors where this can be done in tens of seconds. And that is uh, uh, what. Uh, uh, allows the uh, sensor that I've shown to you before, that we developed for the Alice Vertex detector, uh, which is now is being uh, used for a proton CT camera. Okay, so this for the first time we're able to do a proton CT in tens of, um, of, uh, of of seconds. By the way, also the resolution uh, uh, of these sensors is increased in terms of spatial resolution with the typical micro slip detectors used in the past. There is no high voltage which is always nice and not to put a high voltage power supply next to the patient, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, this is just a, um, an, an example of the, of, the, um, um, of the applications. There are many others uh, in, in the field of uh, medical tracking, in the field uh, um, of uh, um, security. Um, so there are many, many different applications uh, of, of what we develop at CERN. And so, uh, I would like to conclude by saying that, uh, uh, first of all, um, we had uh, really um, um, a wealth of, uh, of results, of physics results, also the breadth of results uh, we achieved so far, uh, allowed us to gain a detailed insight into the QGP properties. Um, example, the macroscopic and fluidodynamic properties, and the, the way heavy quarks interact with the quark bloom plasma, um, I've also mentioned that we have, however, a much broader uh, program, um, uh, extending to hadron uh, physics, um, to uh, also dark matter searches, uh, uh, nuclear physics, etc. And uh, we have completed uh, the phase one upgrades, and we're now ready for um, a new decade of physics campaign. And we also had uh, the approval of the letter of intent for the construction of a new detector for. Uh, the next decade. And my real last remarks is that the high energy physics community is really in a unique position to bridge between different fields 
um, and drive um, for sensor advancement, uh, um, but also for the advancement of many other technologies, including computing technologies and software uh, techniques, um, leveraging on the last decades uh, uh, of experience and the know-how we have uh, uh, acquired. And with this, I would like to thank you for the attention. Gracias.